Yeah, don't worry about this. So, uh, right. yeah. So, so my talk will be about like bypassing um pre-programmed hardware obsolescence. obsolescence. So basically, see, what what see. do I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so what do I mean by that? Right. Let's put the context. In you know in our lives, we often encounter some devices where the manufacturer kind of says that hey, you can only use it one hundred times. Or let's say you have a printer, right? Like the inject printer or something. Once you have used the cartridge, they say, oh, you cannot refill manually. You have to buy a new one, right? So we've encountered many of these devices in our lives. And I had the fortunate chance uh, where I was approached you know, to look at some of these. I, I cannot say specifically what <laughs> I was you know, trying to break. Uh, and But they are kind of expensive, like, like five-digit expensive. So um yeah, I took a look at it and I realized that hey, uh, it's pretty interesting, you know, and uh, I just want to go deeper, right? So the general approach is that um we when you have a device that has a consumable that the manufacturer forces you to replace every now and then. So what do we what can we do about it, right? The first step is to collect a number of these consumables, right? So you have a consumable that is like let's say it's a inject cartridge, a cartridge that is new, right? And then you have a cartridge that is a half used and a cartridge that is completely flat, empty. But the second thing is to look at the cartridge. Usually there is an EP-ROM inside. Now I'm not saying that this method will work for every single device that behaves like this. It just happens that it's the device that look at it. Um, and usually there's like an EP-ROM in it. Why? Because the EP-ROM is a little chip, right? Where it can store some bytes, okay? You can store some bytes and you can write to it a few times. You can read and write from it using a serial protocol usually. Um, and this is how you know the device keeps track of how often you use this. Okay, so after you look at the device, you see, hey, there's an EP-ROM on it. We want to try to isolate this EP-ROM because there might be other devices on the same bus. Like it really depends. Like the circuit board I was looking at had many things, had many things on it. Right? It's not just an EP-ROM. So I need to figure out like, hey, if I tap onto the power bus or the I2C bus, would some other device respond as well? Right. Fortunately, it wasn't too complicated after like staring at it under a microscope. So that's fine. Um, finally, we want to read from the device. We want to collect. We want to do a dump. We want to dump the contents from the EP-ROMs. Okay? It might be one kilobyte. It might be you know, 64 kilobyte. It really depends. You, you have to then look at the bytes. Later, I'll show some examples. And you kind of figure out like how they are enforcing this limitation. I'll talk about some methods later. Finally, I will make some changes to it. I'll write it back to EPROM and then you can kind of test, you know, hey, did the device now allow me to use it again or not? Right, so let's dive into that. So um, two common EPROMs, okay? One of them is the AT24C256. 256 kilobits, which is about 64 kilobytes, right? 32 kilobytes. Yeah. Um, it is an eight pin device. And, you know, I didn't want to desolder that chip because if I desolder it, then later I have to put it back. It's kind of pain. The device did have a set of pins. So typically, if let's say you want to reflash many of these devices, you kind of make a little jig, pogo pin, so you can like pull, flash the device, take it off. Okay. Now, um, so this is an 8-pin chip, and we realized that there are a number of pins on it. Minimally, it's kind of troublesome. You, have, you need to use uh, the power pin, the VCC, ground, SDA, SCL, and WP, which meant for write protect. Right? Uh, WP pin basically says, can my commands write back to the chip or not? Okay. So immediately, you know, you can think that I need to get a get my hands on an EP-ROM reader writer. Like I, there are many online. You can just uh get one from a uh, Taobao or something, right? Or you could make your own, right? I personally use a this thing called an M five stack, which is like a little ESP thirty two again ESP thirty two device sold by this company Thank called you. sorry <laughs> yeah 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 it's, uh, it's pretty common. I show a picture of it later. Okay, the second exhibit is uh, a one-wire EP-ROM, okay? It's DS2431, um, commonly made by Dallas Semiconductors. There are many clones out there as well, so you probably see you know, similar things, same form factor. 
the interesting thing is that for one wire protocol, you only need two, two wires, right? A signal and a ground. There's no power. Why? Because you use a, it uses a signal pin for power as well. It uses parasitic power. Uh, this is a typical diagram. How do you communicate with it? Is that you have to you know, you have a pull up resistor and then you connect it to the pin of your uh, microcontroller of choice. ESP32 usually works as well. Um, you have to read the data sheet. I believe it did run on 3.3 .3 volts. Yeah. So from this, at least for this EP ROM, it is a lot easier, right? I don't need to make a jig because there's so many pins. I just need to like put my tool. Uh, you can you can get probes online, very fine probes with gold tips or just wires. Just poke it there, and because the amount of bytes in so few is like one kilobyte, right? In less than half a second, you just touch it and you let go. You can read the contents or write the contents back to it. It's really easy. Okay, so I use the M5 stack. I believe this is a M5 stack core. It's cost about 30 USD, right? The nice thing is that it has a bunch of GPIOs around it, um, supports the I2C pins are there as well. And it has a nice LCD screen. So I kind of implemented a simple UI where you press the button and say, hey, read and write you know, to the EPROM of choice. I put in a little SD card so that I can read out the contents. I put an SD card and then I put it on my computer. I load it up in Sublime and I can look at the hex dump, which, which I'll show you guys later. So about a couple of concerns, right? The circuit board was fairly complex. There were multiple components. Right? So I was concerned that, hey, should I hook it up to 5 volts or 3.3 .3 volts or maybe 1.8 volts? We don't know, right? We have to look at the circuit board to say, like, what is the minimum voltage I can power it with without frying something, right? So yeah, you kind of look at it, uh, try to look at some data sheets. Uh, we found fortunately 3.3 .3 volts is fine. Okay, uh, how much current do I need? If you have other sensors or something that maybe you know you need like 100 milliamps, I power this through the my ESP32. So I'm just tapping off the 3.3 .3 volt rail. Um, it may not always work depending on the device you're looking at. Okay, multiple devices on the data bus. So for the first EP ROM, there are two address pins A0 to A1. So I had to kind of like trace or to see, hey, what's the address I need to use for that I square that I square C bus? Um, potentially the next three points: encryption, temper resistance, uh, self destruct. Um, of course, fortunately, my device was not that complex, but if let's say the contents of the EP ROM were encrypted, that means that the key would be found somewhere else, and I would need involve more time. Fortunately, it was not. Okay. Temporal resistance, what I mean by that, sometimes a circuit board or a device, you know, when you try to probe it or when you try to open it, you trip something, you break a wire, maybe there's a hidden battery in there that loses its charge. If anyone has ever tried to reverse engineer your uh, OTP token that banks used to give out years ago, you you encountered that. Um, Self-destruct, well, not very common, but some devices can send a high voltage into your flash chip to toast it. So this is a sample dump uh, from two devices. One of them was you know, was not used much, another one was used a lot. And this was from the 256 kilobit chip, right? So, so I did, you know, just think through it, right? Like why would you need a large EP-ROM to store a count of its usage? So it's kind of weird. It's also kind of complex. Honestly, I did not go into the, you know, go deeply into trying to modify this because what I realized is that um, the byte sequences were repeating, okay? So it seems that it's journal. Every time when you use it, it will kind of add an entry of when it was used and kind of shift all the bytes down. Yeah, so I didn't want to like go through and try to modify it too much. Secondly, it seems that there is some form of a checksum at the, like at the tail end of the payload. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't, I mean, potentially you can exhaustively try to figure out like what is their checksumming sequence. You know, you I could reverse engineer the host. So there are two devices. One is a consumable and the other is a host. The host runs some, some Linux machine because uh, there's a little screen there. Yeah, um, but okay, we, we didn't want to, I didn't want to touch the host because it's an expensive machine, right? So uh, this is what it is. So let's move on for this. The second dump is the smaller EP ROM, which had only a very small payload, like one kilobyte or less. So this is really easy because most of it are zeros, right? And of all the zeros, I think the uh, third and fourth byte 
the fourth film and sixth part is the count of how many times it was used. The rest of it seems to be a like a unique ID. Now this chip, uh, the yeah that that chip, the one wire chip actually has a serial number built into the EP ROM. Potentially they could have used that, but later I figured out they did not bother using that. Right, so you guys can kind of predict by what do you think, what strategy do you think could be used in such a case? Yeah, that, that's one strategy, right? Um, so there are two strategies that I tried. The first one is, you know, I could alter, because I know the bytes, it's very obvious that's the number of counts of how often it was used. I just reset it up to zero. <laughs> Right. And uh that, that seemed to work. Um, but I wasn't sure about those bikes at the rear, right? So the um yeah, the it, it could it could be timestamp. Now for, for the first example I showed, there was a lot of bikes. I suspected one of them was timestamp, if not the uh, you know, checksums. So I didn't really like mess around too much with the 256 kilobit wrong. And the second method I mentioned is just cloning. I just read from the if you're wrong, that wasn't used much, I flashed it to the other one and tada, it works. So yeah, that was pretty straightforward. Uh, potential countermeasures, they could have used the EP wrong serial hash against it, you know, to check, hey, was this clone or not, right? Um, the 256 kilobit EP wrong didn't have any unique serial, the one wire EP wrong had, so you know, that's, yeah. Not necessarily need to clone yeah, you, you could save, you could save that, that image and then reload it back later. So we might see that that bypass any text uh, for serials in the you just save cartridge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you know, in conclusion, because I was exploring this, I realized that potentially, like, uh, you know, as a consumer, right, you, you feel that. You want to do this, you can kind of explore first because the manufacturer may not be thorough in their design, right? They don't they wouldn't have more countermeasures. For example, one way is that the host could have kept track of all the serials that you have that has passed through a device before. And if you try to clone the device, you try to roll back the counter, it, you know, they could have picked it up, right? Um many of the mechanisms are bypassed, if not by yourself, someone on the internet might have done it for you. <laughs> it's a popular device. Now, as a product designer, if you build hardware, um, you probably want to be a bit, a bit more thorough in your method of enforcing such things, if, if it's your task to enforce right. such things, right? Um, yeah, you know, and yeah, I think that's like, it, it really depends on what your job, right? If you are like owner of company, then probably you want to pay more attention. So, yeah. Anyway, that is the end of my talk. I hope that's interesting. Any other questions? I I think in mind. Yeah. Because we're going to line up the problem with laser. I think your case with uh with the five digits worth of bytes, they have been exactly as many as the two. Because uh with devices like that, which are usually usually in the state, you do want to have the hard cut off when the cartridge or whatever they're using and produce them. You completely stand to forget if they leave the card machine to the option of the doctor and dad, you get all the resources. On the other hand, this is a five, five, uh, um, uh, five digit device. Uh, there will be very, very few manufacturers who will go through, uh, you know, the hassle of refilling it or using it as an expiring date. You run the risk of filling their five digit device. Mm -hmm. So the boundary you have in there is not just what came from a refilling it. It's clear if you tell people that they usually replace it now, it's otherwise five days to life in time. If you are talking about physically, where the, where the incentives are a lot different, you have no problem, right? Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, I would make a point that the perfect designer were exactly as many as the same. Yeah, I wasn't very thorough in mentioning what the device is. Um, they are, their business model, they're they charging for consumables. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the host is kind of expensive, but the consumables were kind of pricey as well. So there, there are actually two parts to it. They usually want to charge for them. You know, they want recurring revenue and stuff like that. So how many like how many how many I think it's important to buy a five device when I think they're 
Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I don't question so I those things. The, yeah. The device manufacturer will not really as now. The, the business model has actually changed because it looks like a different model. You know, like the razor blade thing, the mm -hmm. concept. Yeah. Then the problem is because I run the text, it's a man mm -hmm. And they get sued for that. Okay, any questions? All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so 